Good morning. Welcome to Monrovia this morning. Thank you for coming to be with us. Please come in and find your spot. I'm stalling for just a minute because a couple of members of our praise team have wandered away. So I'm hoping that they'll return here momentarily. Thank you for coming to be with us this morning. Um, it is a, it's a beautiful day, a uh, great time to be together. Ray has been doing a series on uh, seven, I believe seven, of the signs of Jesus. And today we're going to be talking about the resurrection uh, as one of the signs. So we'll be uh, singing about that, uh, very similar to what we did a few weeks ago on Easter. Uh, but... It goes along with the lesson that we'll have on, on the, the sign of the resurrection. So as we begin, let's all stand together and sing out. We praise thee, O God, for the sign of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, Revive us again. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. O oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. O oh, praise his name. Forevermore, for endless days we will sing your praise. O Lord, O Lord our God, he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. 
Before we pray, I just want to mention that uh, our sister Diane Oliver fell on Thursday and broke her wrist and uh, fractured her back, so we want to keep her in mind in our prayers. And prayer, prayer this morning is taken from uh, Psalms 27, 14, wait patiently for the Lord, be brave and courteous, courageous, yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord God, your message is worth waiting for. I pray that when we pray for your help, may we wait and listen for what you desire in us to hear. We want to follow in the way you have set before us as you work all things for good for those who are obedient and trust you. When we are weak, I pray that you encourage us and that your faithfulness gives us hope in living today, tomorrow, and for eternity. Your truth is sure, your promises are greater than life, and your love is beyond human understanding. We are thankful for your son and his life you've revealed to the world. May we be humble ambassadors of your word and the great salvation you give us through Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, 
I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. you pray with me now our father in heaven we are truly indeed so thankful father that 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 fateful conclusion and beginning happened that day father just thank you for that for that saving gift that was given to each of us. Father, we remember that day now and the sacrifice the sacrifice that made that gift possible. Be with each of us now as we as we break that bread and remember that day that Jesus placed his body on that cross for all of us. We pray these things in his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
continuing on and continue on with me in prayer. Our Father, we we continue our prayer, Father, remembering that day, that day that your son's body was put on that cross and pierced, but not broken. The blood that flowed from his body that cleansed us all and gave us that that ultimate gift to cleanse us enough that one day we would be with you. We remember that now, Father, as we take this fruit of the vine, remembering that everything comes from you. Once again, in your Holy Son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Remembering that all of the things that we have and all of the things that we can hope to have here on this earth and, and the many blessings that are just bestowed on us each and every day, just go with me now to our Father and just give thanks for that. Father, we just are such a blessed people here this morning, gathered this morning. We are not hungry, we are not cold, we are not afflicted with any persecution, we come here freely and blessed before you. Father, we just want to thank you for the ease with which we live our lives compared to those that do not have and do not feel and those that do need. Father, help us to remember that in our giving, in our giving back what you have given us in the first place. 
Help us to remember those that, that can't be here. Help us to remember those who refuse to be here. Help us to bring you to them. And help our gifts this morning to go towards that goal. To bringing you to everyone and to bringing everyone to you. Bless our gifts this morning. And bless, the, bless those that make the decisions on where they go and the help that they provide. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all have had a good week. Um, it's been a while since we've done this, but I want to get the kids to come on up front. We're going to do Change for Jesus this morning. Um, today we're going to do um, uh, uh, sort of a collection, and this what this is going to go for, is uh, raise some money for, for some folks, maybe if they can't go to Camp Nayati, uh, to help fund that. And so that's what we're going to do for the next. They're over here, guys, by Mr. Jeff. He's the second best-looking bald man in here. Greg's the first. Thought I was going to say me, didn't you? Um, but no, so this is going to go toward uh, yeah, funding some stuff for Cam Nayati. Um, and so we're going to do that for the next couple of weeks. And so we appreciate you guys um, helping us out with that. And then um, there's a picture. Uh, we're going to put a picture up. There's a picture. Hey, there it is. Uh, that's one of the new things that Chains for Jesus paid for um, not too long ago. It's a new um, thing in the nursery that they've got back there. And I think it's going better than the other one. If you remember the other one that had like some yellow chairs Sometimes it hurt your legs. It hurt my leg when I tried to get in it that one time. This one looks much more comfortable. So thank you guys for, for doing that. Um, also for Camp Nayati, uh, we do need to get some newspapers. Uh, we have a bin out in the lobby. So once you um, finish up with your newspapers, if you could bring those and just put them in. Uh, we use those. Um, I should have put a picture up there of this, but we make, um, oh, it's on the flyer. Uh, last year we did like this newspaper fashion show. And it turned out really good. They made like somebody, I think it was Evie's group, uh, had Tessa in a dress. And she looked like Belle from um, Beauty and the Beast. I mean, this dress was immaculate. It was unbelievable. Were you guys there for that one? It looked, yeah, it looked great. So anyway, so that's what we're using for that. Um, so please, please bring those newspapers if you can. Um, also, uh, save the date. Uh, Vacation Bible School will be July 14th through the 17th. All right, so we will uh, be releasing more details about that um, pretty soon. And so looks like the kids are finishing up. Uh, those are all the announcements that we have today. We're going to take about six minutes here and visit, and then we'll get back together.
Okay, thank you. Please come back in and find your place. We'll have more time to visit uh, after our assembly and after our classes this morning, but thank you for, for participating in that. We always in, enjoy that time. Now, as we continue, uh, let's all stand together and sing. His blood poured out for us the weight of every sin upon him. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness, a battle in the grave. The war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever to shake the stone was rolled away his perfect love could not be overcome now death where is your sting our resurrected king has rendered you defeated forever He is alive. He is alive. 
Children's Church. I, all right. It's time to go, in other words. Moms and dads are thinking, yeah, it's about time, right? All right. We've been in the book of John, and I'll get to that in just a moment. I've got to make one uh, announcement. We had a, a bunch of people over to house uh, this weekend, and I had a, uh, several plates of pork tenderloin, fresh corn, green beans, and potatoes. So there's about eight to-go boxes back in the uh, kitchen. If you would like one to take home eat today or take with you to work tomorrow, Get it. I need to get rid of it. I hate to throw it away, all right? We've gone through uh, several weeks talking about the different signs from the book of John. And as we end the month of May, we'll be starting a summer series in June, but as we end the month of May, the last two points uh, or things I want to talk about really aren't the signs. You, you know, we've been through each of those, but today... You could probably tell from the songs, uh, we're going to be talking about the resurrection. I know Easter was just a couple weeks ago, and we spent a little time then, but we're going we're gonna to talk about it, and uh, hopefully, maybe just, we can sit back and just relook at that and our faith, the, the whole study from John has been about faith. Then next week, uh, I encourage you, if you have time this week, you might go look this up and read a little bit. We've talked and lived all our life. Uh, really being encouraged to have faith in Jesus, right? Right? Next week, we're going to talk about the faith of Jesus. It's a little different. Uh, actually, it's quite different. Uh, so you might want to, if you have a chance again, just look up faith of Jesus, not faith in Jesus, and, and read a little bit. And then we'll, we'll, we'll spend one week next week talking about that. But our whole discussion really has been about our faith and the fact that uh, God does not ask us in any way to have like a blind trust. Our faith is not like I just, you know, don't, don't really have any, anything to base it on other than I just trust God. The whole, you know, the, the whole discussion of the various signs and what we've been looking at from the book of John is really relating from what he said in 1 John 1, 1 through 3. And I've had this before you each week, but I want to look at it again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. So all that's like physical, right? I mean, that we saw it, we touched it, this we personally experienced. This, he said, we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Around the world, there's a lot of persecution and a lot of uh, you know, talk against any people of faith. In our country, it's becoming, uh, I won't say more prominent, but you, you see it, you, you do see it quite a bit more. It's sort of like an in-your-face. And what I see a lot is that talking about people that have faith in Jesus, that one, it's like a crutch in life, they're sort of weak, they have to have something. But more than that is this discussion that, you know, it's rational people would not choose to have faith in a God or a faith in Jesus. And this, again, whole discussion and what I really want us to think about today is it's just not true, folks. Ration and logic are what would take you to a faith in Jesus, not take you away from it. We don't have to be afraid or fearful of those in the intellectual world that would want to challenge the very basis of our faith we don't have to be afraid of that. And John, a lot of his writings are to encourage us in that very respect. And so today we're going to go to the resurrection because that really is you know, the foundation, right, of our faith that Jesus claimed to live as the Son of God, to live as God on earth, and the fact that he was crucified, but then the fact that he was raised up. And here's the deal. I don't believe in and I encourage you not to believe in the resurrection just because the Bible said so. 
And when I say that, you know, it's like I have to go to the Bible. Now, the Bible does say so, but it's not like the Bible says so. I believe in it because there are people that we can prove existed, lived, and wrote just like any of our other history books. And those folks who witnessed it, who were there, or they talked to people that were there, they wrote the story down for us to be able to read about it and us to have that today. Just like Matthew in the gospel. When you read Matthew, it's an account of the life of Jesus from someone that lived at that time and experienced it with Jesus. Mark, he's a Greek who then wrote about the life of Jesus and documented what happened. Uh, Luke, you know, we know Luke, he was what? He was a, a physician, but he was also what? A historian. And he, uh, you know, I love the way he writes and the way he starts his account because he's writing to Theophilus and he says, you know, I, I've, I've gathered all this information. I've talked to people of, you know, people that were witnesses and, and I'm making this account. This is an account of what took place. Again, so we have all this historical data of what took place. People like Peter, when he wrote to these various groups of Christians that were meeting in all these cities and he uh, and Paul, and they, they would talk about their experience and what they saw. And then a couple, you know, we get to John in just a minute, but this one I guess is one of the, the more amazing is the guy James, you know, the brother of Jesus, and we've talked about this before. He, he, he really wasn't a believer up until this time, this experience. What would it take to convince you that your brother was the son of God? You know, you, you, I mean, you really think about that. This is a guy that grew up with Jesus, yet at the end of his life, he was willing to give his life because he really believed his brother was the Son of God. That's a lot of historical reference. Now, you can go outside of the, the Bible and find writings, but we want to talk just a little bit about John this morning and his writing. Now, John, you know, was... He experienced these things. We've seen him say that, right? All right, everybody with me? John, he experienced it. Nobody doubts this guy, John, lived. A lot of people doubt that Jesus was raised. But this, this guy, he experienced it, and he writes about it. And you got to understand, he was not expecting any kind of death and resurrection. John was still like many of the other believers in that day. At this point in the story, what are they expecting Jesus is going to do? He's going to set up a kingdom on earth, right? These are God's people, the Jewish people that God has blessed them. They've been his people. And how many times is it that they have you know, been allowed to suffer, but yet God would always bring someone that del would deliver them, right? That's been the history of their people that's been handed down from generation to generation to generation. And John and the others are expecting this from Jesus even at this moment. Now, where we pick this story up, is right after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. That was just a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem where that had happened. And the, the Scripture tells us that after that event, there were already those, as we've read about over the three years that Jesus was really interacting with people, there were a lot of people that were beginning to say, hey, something unusual, I, 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 this guy is different, and we believe this guy. But after Lazarus, many people started believing. And so now those that are inside Jerusalem, those that maintain the religious culture and uh, structure of that day, their power is being threatened by this guy, Jesus, because he's spoken against them. You know that, right? And so now he's getting this big uh, following and a lot of these people that have faith in him. And so they are looking for a way to quieten him down. They know Passover is about to happen. Big deal, right? That's when they get together every year and they celebrate the numerous times that God has been delivering them. And so they know Jesus is going to be coming into Jerusalem and they're looking for a way during that time when he's there that they can, they can trap him somehow, they can get him and they can quieten what's going on. So that's sort of where we are. And now Passover comes about and the triumphal entry as we read about Jesus and the others have made their way into Jerusalem and they're celebrating that week. And Jesus, one of his closest guys, you know him, Judas, he's a little impatient, right? This thing's not coming to an end as fast as he wanted. And when I say an end, like Jesus dying, it's not, 
Jesus is just not setting up the kingdom the way Judas would want it done. So I really think in Judas' mind, he's trying to figure out how can we move this forward. So maybe like if he presents Jesus to those leaders that want to destroy him, Jesus maybe will stand up. You know, the, the song we sing, what? He could have called 10,000 angels. Maybe Judas is just putting Jesus in a place to say, okay, it's time now. You need to make your stand. I don't know exactly all of Judas' motivation, but that's sort of what's going on. And he has been to them and said, all right, I'm going to make Jesus uh, available to you. We've talked about this a number of times. They couldn't just go out and take Jesus. You know, when he was just out there and he was with everybody, why couldn't they just go get him? Remember, why? That'd be a revolt, right? That'd be a revolution. There would be, I mean, they just couldn't do that. So they had to do it sort of quietly. But Judas has created that opportunity. But during that time, Jesus, again, has met with a lot of his believers, but he's got those that are closest to him, and they're celebrating their Passover, right? They're, they're having their Passover meal together. And during that environment, in that time, what does Jesus say? He said, I'm leaving something, I'm, I'm introducing it, I'm going to leave something brand new with you. Brand new. It's a new command. Love God, and then you love everybody else exactly as I have loved you. Now, next week we'll get deeper into the faith of Jesus and the fulfillment of the law and the prophet in that discussion, but just understand what Jesus introduced is brand new and we've talked about that over and over and over it is it is different than anything that's ever been the way he lived his life and then what he told them is live your life how exactly as i've lived my life now we know he lived perfect under the law but those that had so misinterpreted and put their own agendas into the law, would have told you Jesus violated the law over and over and over. But he didn't. He was fulfilling and living out the law the way God had always intended. And he's bringing this to light, and that's what he leaves them with. And then after that, Judas, as you know, delivers him up. And then we see the greatest... Act, you want to call it that, the greatest display of love that's ever been. Now, I don't know if Judas or others, when it came into this environment, thought it would end up this way. You know, they gave Jesus, Jesus over to Pilate, and even Pilate, when he looked at him, he said, you know, I know that there's a lot of stuff going on here, and I don't understand a whole lot of it, but this guy, he's not worthy of dying. So what Pilate do? He had him beaten, you know, beaten to just near death. He thought, well, if I beat him just, you know, nearly to death, and then we present him to the people, surely the bloodthirsty people, that'll be enough, right? And they presented Jesus in that state, and the people were so emotionally charged with this event. What did they yell out? Crucify him. And they did. And here's where we pick the story up in John 19. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to a place, the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. And John recites so many things, but you remember one of the, you know, one of the neatest is when he talks to his mom and says, this is your son. He's taking care of his mother even at that moment. John talks about some other things that he said, but then he gets down to this place and he said, he bowed his head. And gave up his spirit. It was finished. There's a couple of things here. Now, I bring, bring you all the, I know you all know the story, and there's really nothing new I can relate about this. 
But I want you to really pay attention to this part because this is where it is so key for us to not feel in fear, not feel intimidated. God did not expect you to just, okay, you know, maybe, maybe it was. God wants you to have total trust and confidence that his son was truly Jesus Christ and he was truly raised from the dead. Look at what John says next. The man who saw it has given testimony. Now, the man who saw it, who is that? It's John. John's writing. And he said, the man who saw it, that, I saw it, and I am giving testimony. And his, it's interesting how he talks, but he said, his testimony, my testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies what? He testifies so that you also may believe. John is saying, I know this is true. I saw it. Now, what is it he's trying to convince you is true? That they took Jesus and they crucified him and he died? At that point that he's making this statement, that's what has happened. I think he's certainly saying that's true, but what he's really talking about is what I'm about to tell you. This is going to sound so unbelievable. But what I'm about to tell you, this is the sequence of what took place. And folks, what he's about to tell us, there's a lot of detail here, and it's interesting how he relates it. But what he's about to tell us is at the very foundation of everything we believe. It's why you live and you believe and why you function in this world different than the world because you know there's something bigger and better than this world. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. Now, you, you couldn't take somebody had been crucified, executed, you, you didn't take them off the cross and bury them, all right? That's not the way it was done. That's why John's sort of telling them, this is a little different. This isn't, they don't usually do this, but they got permission to take Jesus and to actually bury him. With Pilate's permission... He came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. Again, so much detail that John tells us. Joseph of Arimathea, and then he had Nicodemus with him, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought, he wants you to know, he brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. All right, that's a lot of detail. But what he's really telling us is, I want you to know, they, they got permission to take Jesus' body off, and then according to the custom of the day, It'd be like, so they took him, they, you know, they embalmed him, they did all the stuff. They, you know, they, they took all the alloys and the murder, they took everything, and according to the custom, they had, now quickly, they had to do this pretty fast. It wasn't the way they normally did it in five, as far as time goes, but they buried him. They prepared his body. They wrapped his body. They did all that. All right, you get it? It wasn't like they just threw the body inside this tomb and then threw some stuff in there beside him. They prepared his body, and for the Jewish people, they would, well, this becomes important in a few minutes, all right? For the Jewish people, they got it. They understood. They had a picture, and that's what they, this, what, really what he's providing, is they had a picture of what the tomb with the stone in front of it, but especially they had a picture of what that body inside would look like, okay? Now, we don't know exactly what they did the next night or the next morning, but we do have an account shortly after that, and John now is relating more to us. He said, so she came running to Simon Peter, uh, Simon Peter and the other disciple. It's interesting here, John, when he's talking about the other disciple, who is he talking about? He's talking about himself, all right? He, I don't know why he refers to himself this way, but he is. He said, so she comes running to Simon Peter and to John. And here's what she says, the one Jesus loved, that's the other disciple, and she said, they have what? Taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So here's Peter and John, 
They have this picture, and John's described it in great detail, of what the tomb, but especially what the body of Jesus would be like. All right? And it says, she said, hey, they've stolen the body, and we don't know where they put him. Now, I like this detail, and we've talked about it before. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I always thought that's really funny. That's interesting detail. But here's what I think. is at the, you got to remember, at the point John wrote this, Peter had died. Okay? He's gone. So I think John figures, well, you know, I, I can sort of let you know that I was faster than Peter, and Peter's not going to say anything about it. All right, he's dead now, but I do want y'all to know there's a lot of things maybe I wasn't great at, but I could run pretty fast. But now what he feels like, I guess, after he wrote that is, now you know I run real fast, but I got to tell you, the reason I run fast is I'm a scaredy cat. Y'all didn't know that, did you? Yeah, yeah, he runs fast. He's always run fast all his life because he's scared. How do I know that? Because look what it says. When they got to the tomb, he bent over and looked in, at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Why did he not go in? It's dark in there. I mean, you gotta, y'all don't get it, right? He runs fast, he gets to the tomb before Peter, and he just sort of looks in, but he doesn't go in. Now, it's real important, the detail he said, there's strips of linen laying there. If you stole a body, are you going to unwrap it first? What do you think? No, he's going to pick it up. I mean, why would I want to unwrap it? If I'm going to steal it, I'm taking the whole thing. So he says, I looked in, the strips of linen are laying there, but I didn't go in. Now, what do you think about Peter? But Peter came along behind him, and he went straight into the tomb. Why do you think Peter went straight in? Because Peter went straight into everything, right? He was always opening his mouth. He was always the one speaking up, showing up, butting in. That's just Peter. He wasn't scared of anything. And so just in typical Peter fashion, as soon as he got there, he went running straight into the tomb. What did he see? Strips of linen lying there, as well as cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Why all that detail? He's telling you, folks, you can't unwrap a body that's been prepared according to the Jewish custom and then make this, you can't do it. That would be impossible. Finally, the other disciple, that's John, again, he's rubbing it in, who reached the tomb first. Don't forget, I outran him. Now, I also went in. So, he's one. I went in and I, I saw all this stuff. And now, look at this next statement he made, because this is the way it works. He saw, and he believed. You see, God never asks us to believe. He says, I want you to see. Now, you may not be the witness, the first account, but you can see through the eyes of others, and you can believe. Remember we talked about faith earlier, and faith is you can have faith because you experience something, and you can believe in something because you've personally experienced it. But most of us believe in the majority of things we believe in life because somebody told us and we trust them. Right? So much of what I know and what I believe is because somebody I trust related it to me, and I have confidence in that because of that. Again, history. That's the way history pretty much works is people we trust have written it down, we've read about it, and that's why I believe that there used to be a Roman Empire, right? I didn't see it, but I have confidence in those that have told me about it. That's why John's writing this. He says, I saw it, and I want you to trust me. That's why I give you all this detail. You can go look it up. I saw it, and I believe it. What do I believe? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I, I think John tell you, you know, I, did, I, don't, I didn't get all that. And there's a lot of stuff I wrote about that he said. I didn't really get it all. But what I did get was he lived different than anybody else. And he asked us to live and to love like he did. And I did get it when they buried him. 
he had given us some indication that, you know, something weird would happen. And I know when they buried him and I went and I looked in that tomb. That body wasn't stolen. It just disappeared. It just vanished. Now he picks the story back up and there's been a bunch of Jesus sightings. Can you imagine what it's like in that town? You know, people get together and they're out to dinner or whatever and they're asking and they're saying, hey, hey, Mickey, have you, have you talked to anybody that saw Jesus you know, that says they've seen Jesus since he, he, you know, they say he's alive. Can you imagine that? that I mean, that's what the conversation would have been like, right? Because there's been a bunch of Jesus sightings. And they know that they went to the tomb and it was empty. So now there's this deal comes along and it's Thomas, one of the twelve. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples now, they've told Thomas, we have seen the Lord, right? We've seen the Lord. But he said what? Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, folks, we have done to Thomas what we do to so many people. We take one event in somebody's life and that defines them. In fact, what do we call Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Did he doubt any more than the others? No. They all vanished. None of them believed. But just because Thomas was the only one bold enough to that put it on record and say, listen, folks, if I don't get to touch it, if I can't touch that scar, I'm not going to believe. They were all the same way. But, again, we take one event in somebody's life. That's a tangent, but, but, but that is terrible when we take one event in somebody's life and we define their whole life by that one experience. But that's what we've done to Thomas. We put him in that box He's doubting Thomas. Now, a week later, you know the story. His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. I love the detail that John always gives us. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. I love, and, and what do you say? Peace be with you. Boy, if you come and just appear in the room beside me, I hope you're bringing peace. Right? I mean, this almost sounds like a Christmas thing, but I think it's, hey, hey guys, don't get too upset. I just appeared here, but peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do you notice he didn't ask Thomas, hey, when other guys told you, why didn't you believe? Did he? He didn't chastise him at all. He didn't give him some name like we've done. He just said, all right, this is what you need I like what the real rendering of this should be in English. You know, it says, stop doubting and believe. Here is a better rendering, I think. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. See, it's not stop doubting. That's sort of negative. It's just don't be unbelieving. Be believing. That's what's encouraging. Be believing. And what did Thomas, what's his response? My Lord and my God. How awesome. My Lord and my God. Now I say all this to say, then John gives us a statement for us. From Jesus, he said, Because you have seen me and you have believed, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, right? Because you saw me, you believe, but he says, blessed are those. And who are those? That's you. That's Rick and Jeff, Beth and Pam, Swan and Alyssa. I go around and it's, he said, blessed are you that you didn't get to experience it firsthand like these, but... Like John said, Jesus, he performed so many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in the book. But these were written, why? So that you could believe. And he's saying, blessed are you because you've read. And you've taken into account what's been said and you believe. Believe what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I leave you with this, folks. There is 
no reason for fear, intimidation, doubt when it comes to Jesus Christ being the Son of God. There's too many accounts laid out for us in great detail that can be checked out to say he really was who he claimed that he was. And only in him and through him do you really have life. We encourage you to take that thought, to examine yourself. And here's a question. Are you unbelieving or are you believing? God's desire is for you to be believing. Let's stand and sing. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We are the church and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection. That Christ one day will return to earth. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy, worthy is our King. All glory and honor are His to receive. To Jesus we sing because we believe. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy. Worthy is our King. All glory and honor are His to receive. To Jesus we sing because we believe. Holy, holy, holy is our God. have the final prayer uh, just want to bring your attention to the corner over there we have a special shower uh, money tree only it's a money jar and uh, we're celebrating uh, the uh, the wedding to be of Rhonda and Ron and uh, Rhonda hand me a note she said she just wants everybody to know that on June the 1st 3 30 to 5 30 the church is invited to come. Uh, I think I think it's in the announcement. Uh, it's not in the announcement sheet. Where is it? Here. The reception is here. Three thirty to five thirty. So please come and celebrate with them. And uh, we want to uh, celebrate today with a shower, piece of cake, enjoy your meal, and then come out here and have your dessert. Thank you, Rhonda. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings of it. And we thank you for sending your son to show us how to live and to give us an example. And most of all, for dying to save us from our sins and giving us a chance to be with you. It's in his, it's in his name we pray. Amen.